if I ask you to take the antiderivative of 1 over x squared, you've done that before and you can do that. You know you would rewrite this to be x to the negative second. And then you'd use the power rule to take its antiderivative. x to the negative first times negative 1 plus c. Okay, so 1 over x cubed, 1 over x to the fourth, we've done that. Try that same procedure with 1 over x. Yeah, what happens? Like, 0, 1... Uh, I... So I'm glad we're doing this. I'm very glad that we're doing this because it's important to try, everybody, it's important to try the power rule with x to the negative first so that you can see uh, 1 over 0, x to 0, no. I mean, it's actually, uh, I just want to cross off the right side. It's important to be able to see that when you have x to the negative first, the power rule does not work. Okay. It works for every other power. Whether you have a power in a denominator, you can rewrite it so it's a power in the numerator. Whether you have a fractional power, whether you have anything, any other power, it's fine. Okay? But it does not work for x to the negative first. Because x to the negative first has its own antiderivative. Remind your neighbor, what was the derivative of the natural log of x function? Ah, okay, so the antiderivative of 1 over x or the antiderivative of x to the negative first is log x plus c, log x plus c, kind of. We actually need an absolute value around this x. Who can tell me why? Yes, it's not that log x can't be negative, it's that you can't plug in negative values into log x. So we can only plug in positive values for x. So if I ask you, what is the tangent slope generator for log x, you would say it's 1 over x, but immediately, a tangent slope of log x, you're only going to be plugging in positive values to 1 over x. So our domain is kind of constrained by that. But if I went the other way around, and I started with 1 over x, well, 1 over x, you can plug in any value for x except for 0 positives or negatives. Having this absolute value will allow you to plug in positive negatives into this log function. Okay, so if you plug in a negative, the absolute value would make it a positive, and then you take the natural log of it. Okay? Now, we haven't talked about plugging in values yet. Um, don't worry about it too much, but just know that you need an absolute value of x. Okay? All right, great. So, uh, what about e to the x? What do you think its antiderivative is? All right. Because we know the derivative of e to the x is e to the x, the antiderivative must be e to the x plus c. So the derivative of e to the x plus c is just e to the x, so that's why. Boom. We're good. All right. Let's do uh, two quick differential equations.
and then we'll move into the more tricky stuff of antiderivatives. These will be the last two differential equations we're going to do. Uh, we have other differential equations in these notes that I'm actually going to just like skip the differential equation part of it and just want us to find the antiderivative. That way we have practice. On our homework, we'll have plenty of differential equations we'll do. We don't forget the plus C. We then make sure we know E to the 0 is 1. We find C. Now, when I plug in E, I don't need to worry about this log of absolute E. Because E is a positive. Once you take the absolute value of that positive, it's just a positive. So I'm sure most of you were like fine with it, but just so you know, like you can get rid of the absolute value once you take the absolute value of your value. So boom. We'll have to remember to have it in our final answer. We need to remember what the log of E is. We need to remember what the log of 1 is. We need to remember the log of E to any power is the power. Log of 1 is 0 because I can write 1 as E to the 0. The log of E is 1. Okay? So some things that require some reminders log of e to any power is just a power okay go now to introduce the next kind of antiderivative rule we are going to go through four examples where i'm going to ask you to take a derivative first and if you are able to take the derivative and understand where things come from hopefully we will understand where our next rule will come from okay so Let's start by taking the derivative of x to the fifth. Please, underneath the antiderivative of x to the fourth, please take the antiderivative of x to the fifth. So you took the antiderivative of x to the fifth. Derivative Take the derivative. DDX, this stands for derivative. Did I say antiderivative? Did I say antiderivative? Yes. My apologies. DDX, take the derivative of x to the fifth. Okay? And we get 5x to the fourth. Now, what I'm going to do is manipulate this guy so that I get just x to the fourth. And we can kind of see how, oh, I need a one-fifth so that this one-fifth and this five cancel, and it just gives me an x to the fourth, which is why I say, and this is why the power rule is what it is, the antiderivative of x to the fourth is x to the fifth times one-fifth. You know, it's like my answer is right here. Let's we'll see. You kind of understand, like, oh, why? This is why we need this one fifth, because I have this five that comes down. Well, do me a favor, and remembering the chain rule, take the derivative of sine of 5x. This is like a reminder of the chain rule. Okay, and check your derivative with your neighbor. What is the derivative of sine 5x? Okay, yeah. You can use your O and your I if you want to, but we are getting to the point where I see a lot of us just know that I need a 5 afterwards. 
which was excellent. Just to show in case we forgot, whenever we have a chain, we have an outside and an inside, a composition of functions. It's not a product, it's the sign of. We'll take the derivative of the outside, leave the inside alone, times the derivative of the inside. So this is cos 5x times 5. Well, to be able to understand the antiderivative of cos 5x, first we, we assume that it's sine 5x. But we see that's not right, because if I took the derivative of sine 5x, I'd get cos 5x times 5. So I need to be able to manipulate something here so that I will just get this. Or just write down the antiderivative of sine 5x. Good. I need a one-fifth there because that one-fifth needs to cancel with that five. That makes sense. So I took the antiderivative of cosine, I got sine, I left the inside alone, but then I needed to multiply by the reciprocal of this coefficient of x because when I take the derivative of this, I'm going to have a 5, which needs to cancel with that one fifth. Okay? Let's look at e to the, let's change the 6x plus 4. Change this to 6x plus 4, please. Now, before you take the antiderivative of e to the 6x plus 4, take the derivative of e to the 6x plus 4. the 6x plus 4 and the exponent. Okay? Again, using the chain rule, you got an outside and an inside. The outside is e to the power. Its derivative is e to the power. The inside is 6x plus 4. Many of you are skipping this O and I because we've done it enough that we understand we need a 6. So write the antiderivative of e to the 6x plus 4, understanding that if you take the derivative of e to the 6x plus 4, you're going to have a 6. Check with your neighbor. To have, like my answer, these, notice how my answers are, like this is my answer. If this wants to be the same as this, yeah, this will be my answer. So, boom, that's my answer. Get x to the fourth. To get e to the 6x plus 4 times nothing, I need a 1 sixth here. And that matches up with this, which means I need a one-sixth here. That must be my antiderivative. One-sixth e to the 6x plus 4 plus a c. I forgot about the plus c. Okay? Now, this is not just x cubed, x fourth times one-fourth. This is... An ax plus b, a 3x plus 2 being cubed. Now, I'll give you an example that maybe will help you understand what you need. Take the derivative of 3x plus 2 to the fourth.
I get 4, 3x plus 2 cubed times 3. So I got 12. Now, to make this look like that, I'll need to divide by 4 and divide by 3. Well, that kind of makes sense. If I took the antiderivative of just x cubed, it would be x to the 4th times 1 fourth, right? So that 1 fourth is actually going to take care of this 4, so we're good right now. But what I also need is something to take care of this 3, which is why I'm going to need a third. So if I add 1 twelfth, or 1 fourth times 1 third, this derivative would end up being that. So we end up just essentially taking the antiderivative of the outside and then we multiply by the reciprocal of the coefficient of x. I needed a one-third in my antiderivative because of this 3x. I still needed a 4 and a one-fourth because of the x cubed. I needed a one-sixth because of this 6x. I needed a one-fifth because of this 5x. Okay? This is a simple undoing of the chain rule when antideriving. If I have a composition, but the composition is just including an ax plus b, it's just x to the first power inside the composition, I can take the antiderivative of the outside, leave the inside alone, but I'll need the reciprocal of the coefficient of x because of my knowledge of the chain rule. So take the antiderivative of the outside, multiply by the reciprocal of the coefficient of x. Okay, we just did four easy examples. I'm just going to write them down pretty quickly here. Antiderivative of like sine 5x plus 2. I don't know why I keep using 5, but whatever. Well, the antiderivative of sine is negative cosine. I'm going to have that as the antiderivative of the outside. I'm going to leave the inside alone but I'm going to need a one-fifth. Three minus two x to the fourth power. I'll take the antiderivative of the outside. I got a fifth and a one-fifth. I'll leave the inside alone. I'll need a negative one-half. Don't forget your plus C's. Okay? All right, let's do an easy example. Then we'll do a harder, then we'll do the hardest. This one is probably the hardest. Let's do this one first. What is the antiderivative of e to the negative 2x plus 3? Don't forget the reciprocal of the coefficient of x. Go ahead and check your answer with the neighbor. You have the coefficient of x. You're thinking of derivatives. I need a one-half because I know the derivative of e to the negative 2x plus 3 will have a negative 2. Yes. 
The antiderivative of the outside would just be e to the power. I need a negative one half because I know when I take the derivative of this, I'll need a negative two, which is the derivative of the inside, my knowledge of the chain rule. Okay, in the middle, please do this one. One over 4x minus 2 cubed. This is the next level up. We would not use a natural log because the power rule works for any power besides the negative 1. This can be written as 4x minus 2 to the negative third. You can take the antiderivative of the outside using the power rule. Please do so. Take the antiderivative of the outside, leave the inside alone, then don't forget to multiply by the coefficient of x. Take the antiderivative of the outside. Take the antiderivative of stuff to the negative third. Yes. So you add one, multiply by the reciprocal of your new power. This should be a negative second. And this should be a negative one half. And then you need a one fourth. Right? Power rule. Add one. If I asked you to take the antiderivative of x to the negative third, you'd have x to the negative second times negative one half. Okay? So, because of the power rule, my antiderivative of the outside would be 4x minus 2 to the negative second times negative one half. But I need the reciprocal of the coefficient of x because of the chain rule. That gives me negative one over eight times four x minus two squared. I can write it all at once. Plus c. Okay. The one all the way to the left is the trickiest one. See if you can do it. The one all the way to the left. Close. You have the right idea, but you're forgetting the key thing. Close, but you're forgetting the key thing. Can't simplify like that. Good. No, power rule doesn't work for negative one. Yes. Oh. Okay. Now, because a lot of us are getting this wrong, if you have space somewhere, please let's talk about the derivative of log 3x minus 2. Please write down the derivative of log 3x minus 2. We got to remember how to do this so that we remember what's going, what's going to happen when we go backwards. The derivative of the log function is 1 over. The derivative of 3x minus 2 is 3. This derivative is 1 over 3x minus 2 times 3. So that means this antiderivative is not log 3x minus 2. It's close, but it's not correct. Because of this 3, which means I need a 1 
third. No, it doesn't work like that. Uh, it's like distributing a, a square or something like that. You can't just do that. So, uh, I mean, here, here's a good example, Mr. Corey. This is this is a good this is a good question. Is this equivalent to that? No, we know that, right? So. We can always check using numbers, any of these things. All right. The way I would have probably reminded myself that I needed a logarithm is I would have written this as the integral of 3x minus 2 to the negative first. Once I saw the negative 1, I'd say, not a power rule. You can't use the power rule with a negative one. You can use the power rule with anything else. So, not the power rule, log. All right. Now, you need to fit this in to your notes somewhere. We are not going to be solving differential equations. We're just going to be taking antiderivatives. So you can, like, cross off the initial condition for the next one and include this on the right side. Please add this into your notes. It's not in your notes. I made your notes and then I decided, oh, I needed to remind you of this stuff too. I've seen this pop up on the AP test recently. Let's go ahead and copy that down and then let's talk about it. Who here, there hasn't been many students yet, knows what the derivative, the tangent slope generator of 2 to the x is? <laughs> On top of things, Mr. Hinton. Excellent. <laughs> You guys remember that? It's okay if you don't. You didn't see it often. Okay. Now, use your brains. Use your brains. Could you adjust this so that when you took the antiderivative, you got that? You know what I mean? So, like, could you adjust this so that when you take the derivative, you get 2 to the x? Nope. Figure it out. What is the antiderivative of 2 to the x? Swan what do you think? No, your first instinct was correct. What did you say? Yeah. Multiply. <laughs> multiply by 1 over ln 2. Why? Because if I have this divided by ln 2, then the ln 2s cancel. Just like why we need the 1 third. Just like why we need the 1 fourth. Just like we need the reciprocal of the coefficient problem. All right. I want you to cross this out because you already did, and I want you to replace it. What rule is that? That's just like our understanding of canceling things. Find f if f prime is 1 over e to the x. This is a challenge. And if you could do that, you could do this. Yeah. 
instincts. What are we thinking? Is it 1 over e to the x? Is that f? Nope. That's not it. You know that's not true. Good instinct. You're on the right track. Mr. Hattie, what is your instinct to rewrite this as? No, no, no. Before we got that, what did you rewrite it as? E to the negative x. Good. Okay, perfect. Now, everybody, if you can take the antiderivative of e to the 3x, you can take the antiderivative of e to the negative x. What is f if f prime is e to the 3x. Antiderivative of the outside times the reciprocal of the coefficient of the inside. My goodness. One third e to the 3x. Thank you. So, one third e to the 3x plus c. Take the antiderivative of e to the negative x. Take the antiderivative of the outside, multiply by the reciprocal of the coefficient of the inside. Negative e to the negative x. Okay, do this one. 1 over e to the 2x. Hint, start by rewriting it as e to the negative 2x. Take the antiderivative of the outside. We're not using a power rule here. It's e to a power. Antiderivative of the outside is e to the power, but I need a negative one half. This is tricky, right? This is different. This is not just straightforward power rule antiderivatives. We'll need to practice this. Please find f. If f double prime is this, don't worry about all the c's. Just know that f prime, you'll have a plus c. And then when you get to f, you'll have a plus c times x plus another c. You can call this c1, c1, this is c2. This is the whole, like, when you're doing f double prime to f prime, you need to find that c. f prime to f, you need to find another c. So I'm just making sure we have this. But what I'm more caring more about is this antiderivative and then that antiderivative. We need the reciprocal of the coefficient. The derivative of e to the 2x plus 4 is e to the 2x plus 4 times 2. That's why I need a 1 half when I'm going backwards. When you go backwards, when we are anti-deriving, we're doing the opposite of what we're doing deriving. So we're not multiplying by 2. I need to multiply by 1 half. I got that c. When I anti when I anti derive that, I'll need to multiply by the half again. And that's what I'm looking for. Okay. Same deal. Please tell me what f is, and I'll tell you with f you're going to have a plus c x plus c, which is fine. F prime will have a plus c. Pay special attention to your signs. I don't like to memorize antiderivative rules of trig functions. I just have the derivative rules memorized. So it's like I write down my answer, and then I think, if I took the derivative of this, 
would I get positive sine x? Would I get positive cosine x? You did it for this one. You didn't do it for that one. You have the reciprocal, but then you don't hear. We can't forget the necessity of these 1 over coefficient of x's because of our chain rule, our derivative rules. Because when I take the derivative of negative cosine 3x, it's going to be positive sine 3x times 3. Are we done? Holy cow. All right, hold on, hold on. Hold on. Finish this one off. Stop back it up. Stop back it up. Stop. Stop. Antiderivative of the outside. But I need a one third. Antiderivative of the outside. But I need a one half. Notice the negative cosine's derivative would be a positive sign. One extra step. Antiderivative of the outside, sine, it would be negative. But I need another one-third to make this one-ninth. One-third times one-third is not one-sixth. And then the antiderivative. That's okay, a little math humor there. Uh, of sine is negative cosine, I need a one-fourth. Because cosine's derivative is negative sine. Two more examples. Three, really. Let's find f. If we got that f prime, let's find f if we got that f prime. And then I'm going to give you one more. For both of them, I would rewrite so that I understand like what the power I have is. You can't simplify this any other way. And that's what you get. Okay? This negative 2, I'm thinking power rule. This negative 1, I know the power rule doesn't work. I'm thinking log. This is what we have to do. We have to be able to get there. Now, it's tricky when you are using the power rule because you have like two things to worry about, two fractions. I will take the antiderivative of the outside. Uh, 5x minus 2 to the negative first times that negative because of that negative first. That's like the power rule. But then I can't forget about the reciprocal of the coefficient of x. I need a one-fifth there. Giving me negative 1 over 5 times 5x minus 2. I can simplify that if I wanted to. For this one, don't forget about a plus c. For this one, I know negative first, I'm just going to use log. That's the antiderivative of the outside. Log absolute 3 minus x. But what can't I forget about? One 
not a one-third. I got the absolute value. What is it? A negative one. Notice the coefficient of x is this negative one. It's kind of tricky, not three. Okay? Okay. That would go, and we're going to do two more, so fit these in, towards, you know, something like this, 3 minus x to the fourth. I would take the antiderivative of the outside, x to the fifth times one-fifth, and I would need a negative one because of that negative x. Okay, now here comes our challenge. If I gave you two x squared minus three cubed, uh, not cubed, squared, it's got to be squared. There's something different about this one than all the other ones I did today. What's the main difference? X is being squared. If I took, you know, like 2X squared minus 3 and took the derivative of this, Ah, it's not a great example, but we can't just take the antiderivative of the outside. Let's think about that. If I thought it was cubed times one-third, and I had 2x squared minus 3, and then I multiplied this by 1 over 2, it wouldn't work out. Because of the chain rule, I'd have to have the derivative of 2x squared, which is 4x. It's not just four, not just two. So this is not an AX plus B. This is something else. This technique that we just went over only works for AX plus B. Not AX squared, not AX cubed, not anything else. So what would I have to do to take this antiderivative? What's up? Nope. Can't do that. Because then you'll have the quotient rule when you take the derivative. You did it for your quiz today. You simplify first. Okay? Now, this is where, like, things can get tricky, understanding what to do when, but um, distribution is the key. This is 4x to the fourth minus 12x squared plus 9. Then take the antiderivative. See, this is what I'm telling you. Like, antiderivatives, trickier. It involves more brain work. Right? You really have to think about, like, is this correct? You really have to do a lot of derivatives in your head to check. 